We've entitled our little talk this morning, our discussion, Come, Let Us Go. If you have pen, paper, and Bible in hand, we trust that you employ them all uh, because there's much we want to talk. This is not a sermon, um, which is why I consider doing it on roller skates. One does not do sermons on roller skates, but one can do a workshop on, on roller skates. Um, we want to go to a reading in Acts of the Apostles. It should appear on the screen before you. Acts of the Apostles, page 515. This is um, Ellen White's digest of an interlude between Christ and Peter. And um, Acts of the Apostles, page 515. Ellen White says in um, that book, Christ mentioned to Peter only one condition of service. You see it there before you. Just one. Lovest thou me? This, she says, is the essential qualification. Though Peter might possess every other qualification, yet without the love of Christ, he could not be a faithful shepherd over the flock. Knowledge, benevolence, eloquence, zeal are all essential in the good work. But without, ladies and gentlemen, the love of Christ in the heart, the work of the Christian minister is a failure. Now, when she talks about ministers there, she's not just talking about pastors. Anyone who is called to minister for the Lord, the first prerequisite before you go out to minister, you need to assess for yourself, do I love Jesus supremely? How strong is my love for Christ? Because your love for Christ will be tested when you go to serve Christ. How many know that is true? Yeah, whenever you step out for Jesus, you pick up at least one enemy. Amen? And he is a relentless foe. Now, we know that the Lord never sleeps and never slumbers. Amen? Now, who else never sleeps and never slumbers? Mm -hmm. Satan. Never sleeps, never slumbers. So the first thing you need to assess is how much I love Jesus because you're going to meet some people who don't love Jesus. Yeah, and you're going to meet some people who may not particularly love you. Yeah, some of them may be sitting next to you right now. So you got to determine how much do I love the Lord? Do I love the Lord enough to love those who don't love me? And do I love the Lord enough to love those who don't love Him? All right, all right. <laughs> because sometimes when you go to share the Lord, the people that you think need the Lord the most love Him the least and don't love you at all. Amen. So you've got to ask yourself, how much I, do I love the Lord? You may be an eloquent speaker. You may be intelligent. You may be articulate. You may have all of those gifts which are necessary for the upbuilding of the kingdom of God. But if you don't love Jesus supremely, you failed before you have even begun. Now, this is a book that I found last night, and we don't have a graphic for this because I just picked this up last night. It's out of print. It's called Living God's Love. When I asked the pastor, we did this in prayer minute. We read this. I want to read something from you. Written by Douglas Cooper. You can perhaps find one. This is old and dog-eared. I bought this in 1991. I, I date my books. Um, I, I, that's, I date everything. I date my suits when I buy them. I date, I just, I put dates on everything. Every, every suit I have, there's a date right here. I just date things. And I, I date every book from the time I get it and start reading it. So this I bought in 1991. Um, and this is the second one I bought. The first one I bought in the 80s. According, let's see. Yeah. According to the master himself, God's way the heart of Christianity is loving the Father and loving people with all our heart, soul, and body. So it's loving the Father and loving people. It can only follow that the opposite of Christianity and therefore the essence of sin is failing to love. In plainest terms, in plainest human terms, sin is failing to love by being primarily interested in meeting one's own needs while ignoring the, uh, the needs of other human beings. Pretty strong stuff. 
This is turning to our own way. This is precisely what the clergyman did when he refused to go to the hospital. He tells a story about a clergyman who was tired. He had a long day, but he had a member who wanted him to come pray with her in the hospital, and he said, I'm just too tired. I can't come right now. The world and the church are full. The world and the... The world and the... Mm-hmm. Are full of those who are failing God and people this way. Most do not even realize their utter sinfulness, the utter sinfulness of their self-centered lifestyle. A vast majority of even professedly Christian people today are so fervently bound up, so passionately conditioned to meet their own needs only, so totally enveloped in the confining cocoon of their own selfishness that no one else's needs really matter. This is the essence of the sin problem. So before you begin to serve the Lord, the question you have to ask the Lord and ask yourself in the light of the presence of the Holy Spirit is, how much do I love Jesus? Do I love Jesus more than I love myself? It's a very important question because heaven is all from in out and we are all from out in. You got to ask Christ, do I love you supremely? Do I love you more than I love me? Amen? Amen? And for some of us, that is a difficult question to answer. That's Living God's Love, page 15. Great little book if you can find it. It is really something to read. Now I want you to go with me in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 3 through 9. 2 Kings 7, 3 through 9. I went out at the ASI meeting just a little ago and I bought a nice big print Bible. This is a huge, this is, this is a super giant print, print New King James Bible. Really, really big and really, really heavy. I'm in 2 Kings chapter 7 beginning at verse 3. The Bible says, Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate and they said to one another, Why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore, come let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall only what? Only die. And there rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. This is... A, it, part of a series of stories of a siege of the Syrians against God's people. And there are some wonderful miracle stories in First and Second Kings. They're really, really powerful. So they get there, no one was there. I'm in verse 6. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses and the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact. So God caused them to hear a noise of an army that was not there. Their tents, their horses, and their donkeys and fled for the last. Now it occurs to me that if you're trying to get away as fast as you can, you'd get on your horse. Wouldn't you? Doesn't that make sense? Well the Bible says they left their horses left their donkeys, left their food, left their tents intact, and simply ran on foot for their lives. That shows you this is a God thing. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent, ate and drank, and carried from it gold and silver and clothing, and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent, and carried some from there also, and went and did what? Hid it. So they said, then they said rather to one another, we are not doing right. Amen. This is a day of what? Good news. This is a day of good news. And we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come on us. Something bad's going to happen. 
Now therefore, and here's where the title of the sermon comes from, or this little talk, come let us go. Come let us go and tell the king's household. You've got a very interesting situation. We'll just go through it quickly. You've got, you've got four lepers. Now the fact that there were lepers meant in those days that they were going to die. If they did nothing and just sat there, the default setting on doing nothing was death. They were going to die. If they went back into the city, there was a famine in the city. The city was being starved. So there was nothing to eat there. So if they went back to the city, they were going to die. So if you do nothing, you're going to die. If you go back, you're going to die. You really kind of got to go forward. And, I, and I've told people that. I've, 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 I've told a, a, a first day minister, we were talking the other day, and uh, this is back in New York, so several years ago. Have you ever thought about that if you sit and do nothing, you're going to die? If you do nothing, the, the, you're going to die. If you go back, you're going to die. You got to go forward with Jesus. Amen. So they're saying, if we go to the Syrian army, they might kill us. That's the chance we take. But we're going to die anyway. So let's trust God and take the only option that is open to us. Now here's what's interesting. Had they not exercised faith and trusted God, they would have not known that God had already worked. You follow me? Sometimes we're sitting waiting for God to do something and God is saying, I'm waiting on you. I, I can't show you my goodness until you exercise enough faith to get on your feet and get moving. I've, I've got some stuff for you that I want to do with you, to you, and through you, but you've got to exercise, exercise enough faith to get moving. Amen? And when you get moving, many times you find <coughs> excuse me, that God has already worked. So when they got to the Syrian camp, lo and behold, no one was there because God had caused that, that army, that besieging army, to hear the noise of a larger army, and they fled for their lives and left everything intact. Tents, money, clothes, cars, everything intact. Now, you know that's a God thing. When people get so out of their mind that they leave their cash around. <laughs> and their car, keys still in the ignition, and their food, and their clothes. So these lepers come in, and what do they do? They do pretty much the same thing many of us would have done. They went in and began to grab stuff. Praise the Lord. They began to grab stuff and hide it. Couple new suits, hundred thousand dollars, vegetarian meat. <laughs> and it was there for the taking. God had had them to leave it there. Their problem was they hid it. Then they went back and got some more and did the same thing. Hit it. And then the Holy Spirit came into the room. And somebody said, you know, this is not right. You got a whole city back there of people that are dying and starving. And if we just keep this way, something bad is going to happen. Because this is not a God thing. We got good news. And why are we keeping it to ourselves? Come, let us go and tell somebody. How many know that Jesus is coming soon? Is that good news or bad news? Good news or bad news? It's very good news. What are you doing with it? A lot of us are hiding it. Yeah, we're hiding it. And if you hide it, something bad is going to happen. Yeah. You know why Christians end up fighting Christians? 
because they got good news that they're sitting on. Come, let us go. We have to go and tell. It's, it's a Christian mandate. There's no way in the world that you can call yourself a Christian and be ashamed Hallelujah. of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It occurs to me, everybody is out of the closet. <laughs> There's nobody hiding anything anymore. Nobody. Nobody's ashamed of anything anymore. Amen. You know, they have this website where husbands or wives can go and have secret affairs uh, with other people. And just, what, about a month ago, somebody decided to just hack that website and put everybody's name, everybody's name uh, out in the public. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> and do you know that a number of ministers had to leave their pulpits. I didn't hear about any Adventist ministers. Praise the Lord. But a large number of ministers were on that, their names were on that website. Nobody's ashamed of anything anymore. So what do you have to be ashamed of? Everybody's out of the closet. So it's time for Adventists Amen. come out of the closet. Now, our closets are nice. This ain't a bad closet. But it's time for us to get out of the closet. Amen? Amen. And let the world know. And if you hold on, something bad is going to happen. That's why even the Adventist church is going through all of these little exercises and folks getting on each other's case and things are popping up because we're spending too much time in the closet. Amen. Get out of the closet. Yeah. And get in the street and let people know the good news that Christ is coming. And when you go out there, you will find that God is already working. There are people out there who need Jesus, Amen. who want Jesus, who are... Who are, who are literally dying for Jesus. So the lepers did that, and they went and told, and they found out that God had already worked. You know, one of the most humbling things for me, not in my, no my notes, but I'll say this. I, I baptized a woman in the baptismal tank just sitting right here just a couple years ago who who actually heard me laugh on, on the radio. I never thought of my laugh as evangelistic. <laughs> but a little lady was in a nursing home, flipping stations, and she heard this preacher laugh. And she said, anybody laugh like that? Got to love the Lord, and I got to find out what that's all about. Now, I never, I don't particularly like my laugh, but... She heard the Lord in my laugh. Amen. And so she called here and spoke with somebody, and they got to me, and my wife Irma and I went and visited her. And she said, laugh for me. <laughs> so we stayed there about an hour, and we laughed. And then, oh, about two Sabbaths later, I went and got her, and I brought her to church. Amen. And I brought her to church every Sabbath until I had to go, and some other people picked her up for me. And that was, not, I, think, I think that was in May. And in November of that year, we baptized her. Amen. And then one year ago, she died. She spent her laugh, last year and a half in the Adventist church. Amen. And she came because of a laugh. See, God will use anybody, anytime, anywhere, any place. Sometimes you get used and you don't even know you're getting used. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Tell you a quick story. I had an elder who saw a woman, Adventist lady, uh, with two bags of groceries, and he um, hooked a quick U-turn, yeah. missed a bunch of cars because it was raining, and took her home one time. He gave her a ride one time. 
You know, when she died, she put him in her will and left him $19,000. And I was teasing. I said, that was an expensive cab ride, man. <laughs> 19,000 bucks for one cab. Now, you don't do good because you're hoping to get $19,000. You do good because doing good is what good people do. Amen? Amen? You do it because you're called to serve the Lord. And you use every opportunity to serve the Lord. And every now and again, God gives you a little hug. Amen? Amen. Well, 19,000 hugs. <laughs> so nobody's ashamed of anything. And God's people ought not to be ashamed because, praise God, we have nothing to be ashamed of. I, um, years ago when I went into the conference, the Northeastern Conference, and, uh, you know, let me change this. Let me give you a story. Let's, let's do a little test. I got a lot of stuff here. I'm trying to decide what to leave out and what to put in because I see my time is getting away. Do a little test. I was pastoring a very large church. And um, a, a fellow by the name of Michael Jazz came to talk with me as a pastor of the church. He was the uh, production coordinator for a director by the name of Spike Lee. He said, Spike Lee wants to meet you. And um, he'll be here tomorrow at a certain time, so we made this arrangement. We, he came to the church and he said, I, I like this church. I'm beginning, getting ready to shoot a movie called Malcolm X. He said, we would like to use this church as commissary for our actors. We'll have Denzel Washington and all of these actors. And, and, and we'd like to have them have their lunch and everything in this church building because it's right in the middle of where we want to do our shooting. Now, lights went off in my mind. He said, I've studied Adventist doctrine. I know you guys don't eat pork. We wouldn't bring in pork. We wouldn't bring in coffee. Um, uh, but we'd like to give you a budget of $10,000 and all the money you need for food and everything else. And so lights went off in my mind, and I began to sketch out something. And I said, you know what? These actors we would never have in our church. They would never just walk into our church. So we can get them for six weeks. We can do cooking classes. We can do health things. We can do tests. See, my mind is working. We do things. We can put leave literature around. We can do massages. We can do a whole thing. We can, we can minister to a group of people that ordinarily we wouldn't get in an Adventist church. So I took it to my board. Because I, I had, I said, this is it. We can, this, is, this is a God thing. This is, this is wonderful. I took it to my board. Now, before I take it to my board, as I've presented it to you, if you're a church board member, would you go for that or not? Just raise your hand. Oh, yeah. This is a progressive group. <laughs> I took it to my board, and my board said no. Well, I shouldn't put it that way. The board said, half said yes, half said no. And I said, we may be missing an opportunity here to minister to a group of people that will never set foot, I don't think, in an Adventist church en masse like this. Think of the kinds of things we could do. So everybody 35 and under said, yes, let's do it. And everybody 40 and over said, nah, we're not going to do that. So I, don't, I didn't think it was important enough to tear the church apart over. But some things you plant your feet and draw a line. Other things you don't. And I wasn't going to draw a line for that. I said, I think we're missing an opportunity, but if the church does not wish to do it, then we won't do it. Um, so we took a vote. Church was split down the middle. And I said, okay, we're not going to do it. So I went back and I told Spike Lee, um, I don't think we can, we can do it at this time. He said, well, can you find me a church? So I went right across the street to the Methodist church. I knew the pastor. Uh, we were friends. And before I could finish the presentation, he said, bring them. <laughs> so they got the $10,000, and they got the money. But then I found out that um, in getting that church, there was a finder's fee. So Spike Lee gave me $750 just for walking across the street. <laughs> but Ellen White is saying that in these last days, sometimes we're going to have to do different things to spread the gospel. Now, that's where the roller skates came in. Because when I became a conference communication director, I was working with a local radio station. And the local radio station had a Christian skate night. And I had a program on there called This Moment in Time. That's where the CA comes from. My name is Clement Augustus King Murray. That's why it's CA. 
um, so we had a call-in radio show, and the, um, the, uh, my producer said, Clement Murray. Clement, Clement is just, Americans don't like, it's complicated, it's hard to pronounce. I would say, this is Clement Murray. She said, we've got to find something else. Clement's not going to fly. So she said, what's your middle name? I said, Augustus. She said, no, that's not, that's not going to work. So I said, what's it? I said, King. She said, Clement Augustus King, a little pretentious. So the default setting was CA. So it's been CA ever since then. But um, they, they were doing Christian Skate Night, and they wanted someone to DJ Christian music and teach roller skating. So I said, I will do it on one condition, that if you allow us for 30 minutes to turn off the music and have a little Bible study in, in the roller skating night. And they said, that sounds pretty good. I said, yes. <laughs> so right in the middle of, of roller skating, we had a Bible study. You know, I, I led more people to the Lord and to the Evans Church in the roller skating ring than I did in my pulpit. Yeah, see, God is going to use different methodologies in these last days to win people to Christ. And as long as you carry Christ with you, that's what evangelism is all about. Taking Christ to different places and using those kinds of methodologies that God gives us to, um, to evangelize the world. Now here's some quotes from Ellen White that I want to go to. Um, let's put up that Christless grace, guys. Do that for me, if you will. Ellen White uses this term quite a lot. She says, thousands go down to Christless graves, I'm going to paraphrase, why Adventists sit in a church and sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. Something wrong with that. Amen? Yeah. If you just come and sit and sing and pray and go home, you are doing yourself and your God an egregious disservice. There's much more to serving the Lord. And so people are going down to Christless graves while we're doing it. Okay, blessings on the go. Here we go. Let me pop this up. Blessings on the go. All right, let's go to We Need Workers. Change and growth in God's work. We need workers. Here we go. We need workers who can put new life into old methods of labor and can invent new plans of awakening the interest of the church members and reaching men and women for the world. That's why we started this whole, this whole blessings on the go thing. It's not, it's not brand new. It's, it's God's movement for the end time. All right, let's go to our next one. Means will be devised to reach hearts. Some of the methods used in this work will be different from the methods used in the work in the past. But let no one, because of this, block the way by criticism. Sometimes God gives a person a new idea. You need to test it by the brethren and the Word of God because if it's, if it's a good thing, then others will realize that it's a good thing. If you think it's a good thing, and you're the only one in the world that thinks it's a good thing, then it may not be a good thing. Amen? When Danny brought to us the blessing is on the go, he didn't have to do a heavy sales job. We saw it right away. He didn't have to push it. He didn't have to arm to us. He just laid it out there, and we caught the vision. And that's the way it is with the Spirit of God. If something is of, of, of God, many people will see it and understand it. Amen? Rarely <coughs> does God give one person something. Nobody else can see it. Nobody else can understand it. You're the only one in the world that has it. If it's of God, when you share it, others will know that it's from God. Amen? Amen. And if they're not picking up on it, maybe you ought to question where is this coming from. Because if, if it's of the Spirit of God, then those who also love the Lord will know that it's of the Spirit of God. That's why God puts us in a church community so that we can have checks and balances on each other so that every little idea that pops up and bubbles to the surface doesn't become the church policy. But a lot of people has to be confirmed in the mouth and the mind of many people. But if everybody's picking up on it, then you ought to look at it very closely and see that it's from the Spirit of God. All right, our next one here. There are some minds, there are some minds which do not grow with the work, but allow the work to grow far beyond them. Those who do not discern and adapt themselves to the increasing demands of the work should not stand blocking the wheels, thus hindering the advancement of others. 
Just because we've never done it that way before doesn't mean we shouldn't do it now. Amen. And just because it's your idea doesn't necessarily mean that it's God's idea. I'm trying to give you some balance here. Because sometimes people come up with things that are just nuts. <laughs> or God may give you something that is just for you and not necessarily for me. Amen? Amen. So you need to pray and ask God, where is this coming from and what do you want me to do with this? Now, I think my, le my, my next one is do not depend on miracles. This is important. Let's put that up. God does not generally work miracles to advance his truth. It's an important statement. This is Testimonies, volume 6, page 22. If the husbandman rejects to cultivate the soil after sowing his seed, God works no miracle to counteract the sure result of neglect. So you're sitting praying that your neighbor finds Christ. Well, if you're praying and not going, you're only doing half of the work. God's not going to work a miracle. He's not going to do that for you. He wants to do it through you. Amen? God wants to use you to save someone. And God will use any method you know, it's not my, i got to tell you a quick story. Forgive me. Look at my time. <laughs> when I got to the Freeport Seventh-day Adventist Church in Freeport, Long Island, Sister Roberta Carter was the head deaconess of the church, which is rather unusual because everybody knew that Sister Roberta Carter hated Seventh-day Adventists. So how does a famous Seventh-day Adventist hater become a Seventh-day Adventist? The treasurer, a little lady from Panama by the name of Josephina Ashers, Sister Roberta Carter's husband was a deacon in the church, and she never attended church, but he was there every Sabbath. He got sick with cancer and died very quickly. And, you know, we, 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 our attention span is so short. For the first week or so, there were a lot of people around comforting her. But Sister Josephina Ashers realized that Roberta Carter needed some long-term support. So every Friday evening, she made and brought to her Escovitch fish. Now, if you're from the West Indies or the Caribbean, you know what Escovitch fish is. It's kind of long to explain. It's fish in this kind of sauce, and it's, it ain't bad. In any event, not only did she bring fish, she brought rice, and she brought vegetables, and she brought salad, and she brought cups, and she brought plates, and she brought forks, and she brought everything every Friday and made for Roberta Carter a fish dinner. No spirit of prophecy, no 2,300 days, no 144,000, just fish every Friday. Now you may say, well, Adventists don't eat fish. <laughs> and that doesn't matter. Roberta Carter at that point did. So she used a bait that, you follow me? Okay. Now Roberta Carter had two big sons, big strapping boys. Uh, the little one was 6'3", about 200 pounds. The big one was 6'6", six, six, about 240. Big boys. Eat like locusts. <laughs> so she made this food. Six weeks, just made the food, prayed, and left. On the seventh Friday, Roberta Carter said to Josephina Ashers, Hey, tomorrow when you go into church, pick me up. Pick me up. So when I get there a year and a half later, she's the head deaconess in the church. Because deeds of kindness tear down walls of separation and build bridges to salvation. So you got to use the methodologies that Christ puts before you. You may go with the Bible or you may go with fish. Or salad. Or vegetarian meat. Amen. Amen. But whatever God puts before you, you got to use that to the glory of God. And the thing is, ladies and gentlemen, success is guaranteed. You're not fishing in uncharted waters. Christ has said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto 
unto me. Ellen White says we would win a hundred, where now we were, we, we only we, we're, we're now we only win one if we would show love and compassion and caring. See, folk don't folk don't come to the church just because you say we are the remnant. First of all, they don't know what that word means. That's Advent speak. Folk want to know this about your church. Here's what they want to know. Do you love each other? Do you have the truth? Do you practice what you preach? Amen. Amen. And if I make a mistake, do you practice healing ministry or do you shoot your wounded? <laughs> That's what they want to know. That's what brings people to the gospel. First of all, you got to have the truth. The whole truth, nothing but the truth. Then you got to practice what you preach. Then you got to do it in love. And then when people make mistakes, do you put your arms around them or do you kick them out the door? That's why people join the church. And if you don't have all four of those facets, you may get some, but you're going to lose as many as you get. And even those who stay are going to be miserable. So let's show them love and they will come. Evangelism, page 17. Evangelism, page 17. Let's put that up. Evangelism, page 17. Um, let's see. Yeah, here's the one I want. Evangelism, our real work. Evangelistic work, opening the scriptures to others, warning men and women of what is coming upon the world is to occupy more and still more of the time of God's servant. So in these last days, we, we're not to do less of the work of God. We got to do more. You got to do more. And if you, 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 you go and you ask them if they want a Bible study and they don't want a Bible study, find some other way to minister to them. Find another way. And they will show you how they want you to minister. Find another way because there is another way. You can't always lead directly with the Bible. You can get there, but sometimes you can't start there. But find a way to minister, and they will love you for it. Now I'm in evangelism, page 30. Page 30 of the same book, evangelism. Page 30. Um, here's what Longway says. We have no time to lose. We have what? No time to lose. The end is near. The passage from place to place to spread the truth will soon be hedged with dangers on the right hand and on the left. Everything will be placed to obstruct the way of the Lord's messengers so that they will not be able to do that which it is possible for them to do now. We must look our work fairly in the face and advance as fast as possible in aggressive warfare. It's getting tougher. It's getting tougher to spread the gospel. There are some people who attack you for spreading the gospel. There are some places where even 3ABN is, we've got to be very careful with the kinds of things you say because if you mention a certain group, you can get in trouble and get your license pulled. We, we were talking with some people just the other day from another continent, and they were saying that the Adventist pastors there have to be very, very careful and almost speak in the kind of cryptic parables that Christ used because um, they're afraid of bringing the wrath of the government down upon them. The truth is, it's getting tougher to spread the gospel. But God has called us to spread the gospel. And when God calls you to do something, he gives you the ability to do that and the guarantee that you will have success. Amen? Amen. You can't get away from it. So we can do it. Now, I'm in evangelism, page 34. And this one I wanted to get to really quickly before our time gets away. Evangelism, page 34. Shall we not plan to send messengers all through these fields and support them liberally? That's what Ellen White says. We need to make plans to support those. Even when you can't go, you ought to support those who are going. And if you can't go where they go, you can go next door or go to your family or go to your friends. Um, and lift up the name of Jesus. Shall not the ministers of God go to these crowded centers and cities and lift up their voice in warning to the multitudes? At such a time as this, as this, 
every hand is to be employed. Every hand is to be employed. God is saying when you see a plan that is designed to lift up the name of Jesus, you need to assist those who are doing just that. Go where you can, do what you can, but when you see others going and doing, you have to assist them in going and doing. Amen? Because that's what God wants us particularly to go and to do. Because Christ, as I said, is coming so very, very soon. And um, he's coming in. I want to read just a couple things and then um, we'll be done. Ellen White tells us, this is a sheet on public presence. I just pulled this out last night. She says, anywhere large groups of people are gathering, Adventists ought to be there. State fairs, large gatherings, anywhere they are, we ought to be. In fact, she named specifically, at large gatherings like the St. Louis Fair, that's the one I think was in 1888 or so, I was given instruction that as we approach the end, there will be large gatherings in our cities as there, re as there recently has been in St. Louis, and that preparation must be made to present the truth at these gatherings. When Christ was upon the earth, he took advantage of such opportunities. Whenever a large number of people were gathered for any purpose, his voice was heard, clear and distinct, giving his message. As a result, after his crucifixion and ascension, thousands were converted in a day. The seeds sown by Christ sank deep into hearts and germinated, and when the disciples received the gift of the Holy Spirit, the harvest was gathered in. That's again uh, from the book Evangelism. We should improve every such opportunity as that presented by the St. Louis Fair and all such gatherings where should at all such gatherings, there should be present men whom God can use. That's men and women. Leaflets containing the light of present truth should be scattered among the people like the leaves of autumn. Too many who attend these gatherings, uh, to many who attend these gatherings, these leaflets would be as the leaves of the tree of life for the healing of the nations. So she's saying, again, our job as Christians is to get out and go where the people are and lift up the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. And, and I want to say this in something that I had to learn. It is not your job or mine to convert people. Amen. Amen. When I was young in the ministry, I thought I had to fry, fillet, and fricassee them. You know, wash them, clean them up, baptize them, and put them in the kingdom. That's not your job. Our job is to lift up the name of Jesus. Period. And the Holy Spirit does the rest. So if you don't get an immediate conversion or an immediate, yes, I'll follow you, don't get discouraged because that's God's job. You know, I've, I've had Bible studies where you talk to somebody and they say, I just don't see it. What, are you blind? You don't see it. You don't see it? Let's go over it again. Well, I just don't see it. That's not, that's not a slight against you. That's a wrestling with the Holy Spirit. So you leave them in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And you never know, but when the time comes, God will bring it back and he'll ripen that seed. I've seen it over and over and over and over and over again. We had a, a neighbor. We had a neighbor. Well, let me tell this last story. Now, let me tell. Um, Pastor William Scales. Um, he was the... I think it was health ministries director of North American Division. He moved into a neighborhood, bless his heart. They were the first, how can I say this diplomatically? They were the first family of Eurotrichus hair and ustulate complexion. <laughs> um, first black family neighborhood. And the, the lady that lived next door to them was so incensed that this black family was moving there. She actually tried to run Elder Scales, general conference worker, over with her car. But instead of returning evil for evil, they began to fast and pray for that lady in that family. And they looked for an opportunity to serve. True story. And one day, um, uh, Sister Scales was sitting in her kitchen, and she saw the neighbor. They had, like, adjoining driveways. And she saw the lady get out of her car with a bag of groceries. 
she reached into the back of the car and got a second bag of groceries and tried to close the door with her hip. You know, you try to just hip the car door closed. Well, when she did so, the top of the car door just unzipped this bag of groceries. And of course, all the groceries fell. Now, when you lose a bag of groceries with this arm, what do you instinctively try to do? Yeah, you instinctively try to grab it, and then what happens to this bag? Yeah, you lose this bag too. So both bags tumbled to the ground, and out popped a large jar of Maxwell House coffee exploded on the ground. So Sister Scales ran, got a broom and, and a dustpan and came out and began to sweep and help her clean up. And she didn't even let the lady talk. She just began to serve her. And she could feel the vibes. You know that she knew that her service wasn't being that well received, but she didn't let that bother because she was on a mission for God. So she grabbed the woman. She said, you know, this coffee is not good for you. And she gave her a list of things that, this is not good for you. I've got something in my house that is better, tastes like this coffee, and it's better for you. It's healthy. And I don't remember if it was Roma or a breakfast cup or a cafe. So we got a bunch of them, you know, post them, whatever. She grabbed the woman and drug her into the kitchen. <laughs> she just drug her into the kitchen. And she said, try this. And uh, she brought out some cinnamon buns, and they spent the, almost the whole afternoon together. So by the time General, uh, her husband, uh, Elder William Scales, comes home from the general conference, this woman is in the kitchen laughing and talking with his wife. Now, shortly thereafter, Elder Scales died of cancer. And within maybe two years or so, his wife also passed of cancer. They did not live long enough to know that that family is Seventh-day Adventist today. They'll meet them in the kingdom. What a grand and glorious reunion that will be. Because deeds of kindness tear down walls of separation and open up doors for salvation. There is a way to touch every heart. And if you love Jesus enough, you will love those for whom Christ died. And it doesn't always mean leading with the 2300 days or even the Sabbath. Sometimes it's just a cup of water. Sometimes it's just a, a kind word, just a smile, just a tip for healthy living. Just a God bless you. Just a little card at Christmas time. Now, you may not keep Christmas. You may not even like Christmas. But they do. So use something that will attract them. Amen? Amen. Amen. And let Christ shine out through you. Ellen White says, If you love Jesus, then you will love those for whom Christ died. And I say again, the very first question that each of us must ask ourselves, and I dare say we need to ask it every single day, is how much do I love Jesus? And if you love him enough, then no sacrifice is too great to lift up the mighty and matchless name of the Lord.